Welcome to Mythical Ireland. I'm Anthony Murphy and this is the Mythical Ireland podcast. A new article published in the Nature Journal suggests that uh, the ancient population of Britain was almost completely replaced by newcomers around four and a half thousand years ago. Now this is uh, according to BBC News. And I'm fascinated by this because I think a lot of this probably applies to Ireland as well. Uh, so this is a, as, as a result of um, a, an analysis of DNA, which was extracted from 400 ancient remains across Europe. So a fairly uh, huge study. Um, and it suggests that the newcomers, who are known as the Beaker people, replaced about 90% of the British gene pool in the space of just a few hundred years. So the lead author uh, of that uh, study is Professor David Reich from Harvard Medical School in Cambridge in the US. And he told the BBC the magnitude and suddenness of the population replacement is highly unexpected. Now there's speculation as to what might have led to uh, this huge change in the gene pool. Uh, the reasons could be down to climate change, disease, ecological disaster, etc, etc. Now, previous to the arrival of the Beaker people, you know, we had in, in Ireland and, and obviously also in Britain, uh, the arrival of the Neolithic, which saw agriculture introduced to these islands approximately starting about 6,000 years ago. The farmers, um, they, they, they originally came from what we would call modern day Turkey or Anatolia. And these are the guys, uh, the people who are responsible for the construction of Newgrange, Nouth and Douth and some of the other great uh, megalithic monuments of Ireland and Britain. Um, but the the article says that towards the end of the Neolithic, so around 4,450 years ago, a new way of life uh, spread into Britain and presumably Ireland as well from Europe. People began burying their dead with stylized bell-shaped pots, copper daggers, arrowheads, stone wrist guards and distinctive perforated buttons. One of the co-authors of this massive study, Dr. Carles Laloesa Fox, I hope I have that pronounced right, said that the Beaker tradition possibly started as a kind of a fashion in Iberia around 5,000 years ago, uh, but that the culture had spread very fast to Central Europe uh, and then exploded in every direction from there. Now, Professor Reich told the BBC that archaeologists had been long sceptical about proposals of large-scale movements of people in prehistory, but that the genetics are showing that uh, these large-scale migrations did occur even after the spread of agriculture. And the Beaker people were a distinct population from those of the Neolithic uh, what, what I'm interested in in all this is the fact that, you know, just towards the end of the Neolithic in Ireland, right at the time, the passage tomb or chambered cairn construction reached its apex with the massive sites of Newgrange, Nouth and Douth, which are the foremost um, in terms of their grandeur and their size and the sheer amount of labour and material that went into them. Um you know, that right at its zenith, um, they stopped building monuments like that. And this is something I refer to in my books, especially in Newgrange Monument to Immortality. You know, um, one of the co-authors, Mike Parker Pearson from the University College London, who, who I think has carried out excavations near Stonehenge, if I'm not mistaken, he said that the Neolithic Britons and the Beaker groups organised their society in very different ways. The construction of massive stone monuments, which involved the cooperation of hundreds of people, was an alien concept to Beakers. But that the Neolithic community has that absolutely as its core rationale, and that's a direct quote from Mike Parker Pearson. The Beaker people are not prepared to collaborate on an enormous labour mobilising projects. Their society is more decentralised, said Professor Parker Pearson. Uh, 
We don't have a good expression for it, but the Americans do, and that is, nobody is willing to work for the man. So it's really very fascinating. Um, you know, uh, like it's long been pointed out that, you know, the type of monument that was constructed in the time frame that we're talking about, the arrival of the, the Beaker people, which is at the very end of the Neolithic, and I suppose at the the threshold between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, uh, that everything changes, the type of monument that's being constructed uh, especially changes. You no longer see these large chambered cairns or passage tombs. You start to see uh, open air enclosures like the henges or the embanked enclosures of the Boyne Valley region. Now, something I'm also very interested in is, I wonder does this tie in with the invasion mythology of Ireland, the Lower Gawala, the Book of Invasions? And I was speaking about this to Fran McKeown of the Off the Lead podcast only earlier this week. We spoke quite a bit about the invasion mythology. And of course, although the invasion mythology is pseudo-historical or probably almost purely mythical, one has to wonder if there isn't some um, core element of it that might relate to historical movements of people. So, here we could speculate because of the association of the Shi or the megalithic monuments, especially those of the Boyne, with the, the gods or the deities, the figureheads of the Tua de Danon. Uh, and then the Milesians come and they are, I suppose, very much sort of like mortal men and warriors and women, of course. Um, I just wonder if the... Lower Gawala doesn't reflect in some way um, these actual movements of people. Now, what's particularly interesting about this is that this latest study does suggest that um, the Beaker tradition probably started in Iberia. And, you know, we have this mythology about the Milesians who come from Spain to take Ireland from the Tua de Danon. And they're, um, they are the sons of Mil, who is the king of Spain. His name means soldier, by the way. Mil means soldier. Mil España, uh, the soldier of Spain. And his sons come to take Ireland from the Tua de Danon. And they are victor victorious or successful in this regard after the Battle of Talche or Teltown. Uh, an accord is reached. And this, again, is discussed at length in the Off the Lead podcast. Um, and eventually um, the the agreement is reached between the Dedanans and the Milesians that the two of the will occupy the Shi or the mounds, which are effectively access points or portals to other worlds and other realms. And that the Milesians will take control of the actual territory of Ireland, the land, the, you know, tangible, physical landscape of Ireland. And I've seen it suggested before, and I can't remember by whom or in what book or in what film, that isn't it possible that the Tua de Danon in the myths relate to the uh, vanquished or diminished or dying out people of the Neolithic who had built the great stone monuments and that the Milesians may well represent another wave or influx of peoples bringing with them new ideas, new beliefs, new practices. And here we are now with all of this speculation being apparently borne out to some degree uh, by this great study published in the journal Nature. Um, and I'm fascinated by it because um, the Dedanans, um, they they used something that was given to them by Mananon or Mananon MacLear, who is one of the chief deities of the Dedanans. He presented them with a thing called the Feth Fieda, which is a cloak of invisibility. And this is what the Dedanans used to shield themselves from mortal men so that they could not be seen, so that they could 
wander in and out from the other world into this physical world without being seen and without interaction with mortal men. It's all very fascinating because by the time the beakers arrive, you know, um, that way of life um, is is either already dying out or is about to die out. Um, and for one reason or another, the 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 fabulously lavish and complex and gargantuan monuments of the Bend of the Boyne represent a zenith of basically a dying culture. So whatever happened, through the influx of new peoples, whether there was disease, conflict, environmental catastrophe, the population of the Neolithic people of Britain at the very least, and I suppose probably or possibly by extension in Ireland, becomes much diminished. We do know that in Ireland... As I said, that is the apex of their monument construction. So we are talking about uh, a period of construction that lasted in the Boyne Valley from about 3300 BC to about 3000 BC. So a few a few centuries leading up to about 5000 years ago. Uh, and it's all very fascinating um, because it is possible and it's just possible. And I'm merely speculating about this. We can never be sure, of course, but uh, genetics is a relatively recent uh, development in the study of the movement of cultures uh, across the world. And specifically, of course, I'm more interested in Europe. Um, Ireland was the last place, really, that the Neolithic farming revolution reached. Uh, so it's fascinating then that there should have been a sort of a follow-up culture that came in, a beaker culture that was very different to what had been here. Another thing is that, you know, the people who are in, of the, the, the... Apparently, I've read that the modern-day population of Ireland, the fair-haired, blue-eyed people, um, like myself, for instance, I'm fair-haired and I'm blue-eyed and I'm quite tall. We do not trace our direct genetic origins to the Neolithic population but rather to populations that came later in what we might call Celtic times um, probably more likely the Iron Age but anyway I'm not an expert on this and I would have to do more reading to bring some clarity to it uh, however um, nonetheless uh, the overbearing point of the podcast is that the um, genetic and archaeological record is in some way echoing, in some way reflecting um, what was spoken of in the myths. And it's, it should be no surprise, as an insular island nation cut off from Europe and cut off from the rest of the world, if you consider it to be cut off, given that many of the ancient cultures were maritime cultures and were very, very competent seafarers. Uh, well, um, it should be no surprise that Ireland would be a place that would suffer or endure or experience invasions, influxes, immigrations of, of people. So it's all very fascinating. Anyway, uh, if you want to read more, uh, that's uh, on the bbc.com website in the science and environment news section. And the editor of the article for the BBC is Paul Rinkham. Uh, anyway, this has been my first podcast, hopefully the first of many. Hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget that Mythical Ireland, uh, you can... Uh, find out much more uh, by visiting my website which is mythicalireland.com my facebook page facebook.com forward slash mythical ireland and indeed if you are interested you can also follow me on twitter and instagram same handle mythical ireland uh, thanks again and i look forward to um, giving you more podcasts in the near future this is anthony murphy <laughs>